Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. In today's video I want to talk about the mistakes that junior admins make, junior system administrators make, that could potentially jeopardize their career and how you can avoid them if you are in such a role. So first of all, an example from my own, uh, I want to say, work experience. I worked 26 years in information technology and when I started out in my first real role as a system, it was more like a computer operator, system administrator, it was a mixed type of role, I made a change to a production domain controller and well, the domain controller locked up after I made the change and uh, it's like I had not documented what I was doing. Uh, I did not really understand what I was doing and uh, yeah, it was uh, quite a disaster. Uh, I was able to fix the problem after several hours, but the impact to the small company that I worked at at that time was significant. So don't underestimate that a small change that you think is just the right thing to do uh, can have a really big impact. And uh, the larger the environment is that you work in, the higher the risk is that if you make a boo-boo that yeah, it could put your career at risk. So let's talk about these type of things. What are the mistakes that junior admins make? and how you can avoid them. So first thing is change management. Change management can be really a lot of red tape. It could mean bureaucracy. It could mean that you're not able to do the change that you want to make without going through hoops to be able to get to that point, to push the button and to make that change. So change management it can be really cumbersome. It can be a difficult process and each company does it slightly different. And in some companies, it's a fairly straightforward process. And in other companies, it's like, oof, you have to write a book and then have to get it approved by several people or a committee uh, so that uh, you can implement the change. Change management, yes, it can be a pain in the rear, but it can also save you. Uh, a good change management process should include A, the change that you're making, why you are making it, when you are making it, how you came back out, and uh, all these related things that give you a certain, I want to say, peace of mind, some additional security that you are making the change correctly. Because if you have to put that initial thought in in the beginning, uh, the chances are that you actually go and make this change successfully are significantly higher compared to uh, you read something on Reddit and it's like, okay, let me try this. You type it in and, and suddenly all things go down. So change management, I'm not a fan of it personally. I'll do it anyway, even though I don't like it. But the main reason is why I do it. I learned from experience. I've seen how important change management is. And uh, yes, if you work in IT or in cybersecurity, change management is part of the deal, if you like it or not. So change management, very important. And yes, you will not remember the change that you made three months later when you're troubleshooting your problem. And it turns out that there is an unforeseen consequence from a change that you made. So don't think that you're better than everyone else. You have a photographic memory. So it's like, no, you will forget in those moments change management where you document the entire change is super important. So uh, that's a very important lesson to be learned. And if you can bypass the learning by uh, accepting change management as something good, even if you're even so you don't necessarily embrace it or you are a big fan of it, uh, just do it anyway. So next we come to the topic of documentation. Documentation, nobody's a fan of. You have to write things down. You have to type them out. Uh, you have to name it properly. You have to file uh, the documentation somewhere, depending on if you have uh, just a simple file folder structure where you save documentation, or if you have uh, a software solution that helps you. But documentation is so important. And the question is, what do you want to document? And uh, really the level of detail, how far do you have to go? So let's look at uh, documentation from the perspective that uh, we're doing so many things. Technology is evolving so quickly around us and it is um, so important for us to remember certain things. And we really live in a time of information overload. You open up your phone, you open up your computer and information is just coming towards you from all the different directions. You're being copied on email strings with uh, topics where you have maybe a tiny little bit piece of work to do, but you get 500 emails over 
the course of a month related to this topic. And uh, you have to yeah, kind of read some of those messages to, um, to make sure that you're not missing a certain thing related to your task in this project. Then also the documentation is important because when you start looking. So when you are involved in a project or when you're just doing day-to-day -day system administration, uh, documentation is important. And so let's go to the next step, what needs to be documented. You want to document server configurations, network device configurations, installation procedures that are not standard. So these one-off software packages that you potentially have to uh, take care of, uh, you have to document the process. Uh, as an example, when uh, I was working in a systems engineering role, um, I was working with uh, Microsoft SEOM or SCRAM, which is a monitoring software. And I would say this very simplified, it's, it's a lot more. But uh, we had to move it to a new server because the company where I worked at, we had the mandate every three years, a server gets retired and you move to the latest operating system and you move to the latest software of this application if there is something like this uh, at the same time. So it's a very challenging task uh, at that time to a, you have to move to a uh, potentially new operating system and then you have to upgrade the software. And uh, so there's a lot of things, if you don't document those, it might be impossible for you six months later to restore the software because maybe your documentation is outdated now because you have the old operating system and the old software installation, not the new one. So very important uh, just from, from that perspective that you document the critical steps, anything that is non-standard, go into more level of detail because if it's standard, it's easy to find on the internet. If it's non-standard, sometimes it can be impossible to find that information that you're looking for. Other things to document are troubleshooting steps. Again, if it's a standard troubleshooting situation, uh, it's easy to, let's say, bookmark a certain web page. But again, the more complex a troubleshooting process is, the more important is that you document it. You don't have to write a book. Bullet points are fine. Or if you do even a screen recording as an example, uh, again, this could be very helpful down the road and uh, yeah, save you a lot of hours of researching and trying to remember uh, what did I do at that time. So uh, just think about it. The documentation is very important. And then the other thing is uh, regular maintenance tasks. So the the main point for most people when it becomes clear that okay what am I doing every day is let's say when you are leaving a job so you have to cross train somebody that takes over your role or covers your role until there's a replacement found and you have to explain your day-to-day -day tasks so regular tasks especially maintenance uh, document those as well and those that's the easy part really you don't have to do it right away you can do this over time Time. just document one or two tasks over the next week or two and as you grow with with that uh, suddenly you have the whole information um, you're sick so you have a family issue where you have to um, just leave the country or leave the state to help your parents or help somebody help your wife help your um, spouse in general or you have a sick child that needs to go through some expensive surgery and you're just really your mind is somewhere else you just want to go and take care of the family it's easy to hand over documentation to somebody. Hey, this is what I'm working on. These are the open items. If you have any questions, just call me or text me and I get back to you as soon as I can. But if you have it all documented, that is the easy part of doing. If you don't, uh, well, you're screwed because now you have a stressful situation at your hand and uh, you want to make sure that the company that you work for is in good hands, but you cannot hand it over. So just think about these type of things. And again, prioritize when you document what. If you have a critical troubleshooting situation, that needs to be documented much earlier compared to a maintenance task that you're doing every week, every day, maybe, whatever it is. So just prioritize and uh, even if you just like, okay, put all your notes together into one Word document, come back a week later, but don't wait three months to document, uh, let's say, a troubleshooting procedure or a software installation because you will forget things and uh, there's no way you can get it back together. With documentation, I'm a big fan of screenshots. Screenshots often tell a much better story. I also use uh, snag it that can do a stream recording and uh, the stream recordings I'm not just using for documentation purposes but sometimes it's just easier for me to record a troubleshooting step and then send this to an end user as an example that is remote and that is not necessarily at the computer at that time and uh, then that person can follow the troubleshooting steps at their own leisure so uh, again it's documentation prioritize it use tools that make documentation easier
The next mistake that uh, junior admins make, they are very focused on the technology and they don't think about the people they work with, the people they work for. So it's easier for you to communicate with your peers on the same team. There's a lot of introvert people that work in IT and even that could be a challenge sometimes or you have a hard time just explaining what you do. I'm not a native uh, English speaker, I have an accent and for me it was in the beginning really to overcome the fear that my accent would not allow me to articulate correctly what I wanted to explain to that person. So, But once you start dealing with these type of problems, uh, you come to the conclusion, okay, if you want to advance in your career, you have to talk to people. There's just no way around it. And it starts with writing emails that are really easy to understand. I personally use a tool called Grammarly. Uh, it works in Word, it works in the web browser, so in, in email everywhere. It, uses, uh, it works in Microsoft Outlook. So it helps me as a non-native speaker to write out sentences and then potentially, if I'm really far off, get a better recommendation of how to rephrase it. That communication then turns into a very clear piece of email, a Word document, whatever it is, that somebody else can read and understand. And they might be impressed with how detailed, uh, detail-oriented you are and uh, it can help you with your career. The same thing is talking to end users. And I'm not just saying you're a junior system administrator, you're helping with troubleshooting. Uh, it's very important for you when you work in IT, and I would say almost any type of role, try to communicate with your managers and managers of others and the manager of your manager and so on. The higher up you go with being able to communicate and really help the IT director, the senior director, the VP, even the CEO, CIO, CFO uh, with certain situations, it can set you up for a, quite a successful career development. So here's an example from my own experience. In my previous role, I started as an IT manager and I was tasked with building up the support team for the US, for the company I was working at. That got me a lot of exposure to really a lot of people that were coming in because we were hiring at a really rapid pace. And so I was dealing with a lot of uh, vice presidents, uh, senior directors, uh, chief executives. So I was uh, flown out to North Carolina to help onboarding the chief medical officer, as an example. And yeah, the more you put yourself out there and start communicating with these people and feel comfortable around these people, uh, it makes it so much easier down the road. For me, this really helped me to get a promotion and uh, also being an important part of the team when uh, the chief executives were flying to a certain uh, conference or an event and they needed um, or they wanted the assurance that everything is working well from the tech perspective. I was often invited to come along and to be there just in case because it was so important that certain presentations or meetings uh, went off without a hitch and without any issues. And uh, so I was flown out to those locations and then uh, I want to say was a high paid, I don't want to call it babysitter, but there were situations where I just had to walk into a board meeting as an example. It took me 30 seconds to fix a problem, but think about who is in a board meeting. So the board of directors, the chief executives and other very important people for the company. Time is money and if you can just walk in and you have the confidence and you are able to communicate in those moments, makes your life much, much better. Mistake number four that uh, junior admins make. Build a test environment. Very easy, very simple. If you don't have a test environment and you're making all your testing in production, it's a recipe for disaster. Don't do that. Even if you just use a virtual environment to test out certain things, make sure that you go through the motions and understand that your test environment needs to match your production environment. It doesn't need to be 100% match in every case, but in other situations it might have to be a 100% match. Otherwise you're not able to really determine if that change that you're trying to make. But a basic test environment where you can run scripts, where you can run PowerShell commands against the domain controller or uh, into the cloud uh, without hitting the production environment is very important. It's also for you not just for testing certain things but uh, for learning. So when you work in IT and cybersecurity, learning is just part of the job. The day you start until you retire from this type of career, uh, you will have to learn about new technologies, new ways of working, deal with new hardware, software, AI and so on. So your learning starts when you 
step into the world of information technology, it stops uh, when you leave. In a test environment where you can experiment and uh, break things down and build them back up again uh, will save your career eventually down the road. So very important. If you don't have a test environment and there's not a whole lot of money, start being creative. Use old hardware uh, to simulate an environment. Also separate your networks. Don't do it on the production network. Have your own network segment where you can do the testing so that nothing can hit your production environment. It's so important and uh, too many people just uh, skip this step because it's so much easier to log in and uh, I just run it against this domain controller and uh, against um, this exchange online environment. Nothing will happen. I'm good with that stuff and sure enough things go downhill. So uh, just be uh, on top of it, use a test environment. Mistake number five that junior admins make. I mentioned just previously, learning is a very important part. And it's not just learning the technology, but you have to look at your career development in general. So yes, you can move up in your career by having a lot of technical knowledge. But the higher up you move, there is more to just being a senior engineer, a senior system administrator, a lead system administrator, a lead developer, a lead whatever, an IT manager, and so on. Your personal development, your career development is important and you need to prepare if you want to move up. If you're happy with where you are, you can do that, but that also pushes you into a dead end road uh, where you at one point will be stuck because the world around you changes so much so quickly. So don't forget about that development. Uh, you, especially in larger companies, uh, there's usually the annual review, your performance review, and it often includes also a portion about career development. And uh, these processes have like a beginning of the year process and a year end process. In the beginning of the year, you set your performance goals and uh, potential career developments. So don't forget about these things. Uh, it's too easy to, okay, I do this in January and then I forget about it. And then in November, you get the email from HR. Hey, it's time for your um, annual performance review. Uh, please update your performance goals and whatever else from the year and uh, add your comments so that your manager can look at it and so that it's too late. So there's 10 months in between uh, where you potentially completely forgot about certain items. Happened to me even later on in my career. It's uh, it's still, I wanna say, embarrassing to a point, uh, but it's also important. It's a good reminder. Uh, put it in your calendar, and that's what I'm doing. Put a monthly reminder in your calendar. Just review your performance goals. What did you agree with your manager on to achieve this year? And same thing with the personal development. So carve out some time. If there's no time at work, yeah, you have to do it at night at home or on the weekend. Uh, I'll block out time on my work calendar and then just have smaller chunks where I just take 30 minutes and educate myself on certain technology developments as an example. 30 minutes goes quick and even if I then work that day nine hours and um, of those nine hours, 30 or 60 minutes are my personal development, it's still part of what the company is expecting me to do and they will benefit from it. So if there's not a big budget for training anything, look around and try to find resources that are free and start with the, uh, I wanna say, the manufacturers of the product that you work with. Microsoft has a whole area of learning uh, stuff on their website. You can even then go down that path of becoming certified. Same thing with other vendors. They have usually like even their own university, and I put that in quotes, uh, online where you can educate yourself about the product, uh, get in touch with the sales rep or account manager and ask them for resources. Also, if they have any events going on, ask there and, and get included, get the invites to those events. It makes a big difference because you're not just going and learn about new developments from that company, but you can also network with other people. And that goes not just for networking purposes, it's also communication. You feel more comfortable around people and uh, you don't have, I wanna say, the imposter syndrome that you feel like you're not worthy to be there. Yes, you are worthy, but you also have to make it work by putting the appropriate effort in. So those are the five mistakes that junior admins make. From my perspective, I made quite a few of those myself. Uh, you wanna make each mistake only once and learn from it and don't make too many mistakes. So I think it's very important to really build that picture, build that framework and uh, set yourself up for success. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please do so as well. And then I would say I see you next time in my next video. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Bye bye.